Live from Case at 12, Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Monday, November 9th. Thanks for joining us. We want to start off with some really good news on Wall Street. Right now, we want to take a live look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, where the markets have opened soaring right now to over 1,100 points on some great news from Pfizer this morning. That's right, uh, because after Pfizer said its COVID-19 vaccine is 90% effective, and also uh, CNN reporting that Joe Biden was projected to be the winner of the presidential election, that's why we see the stocks this way. So a big rally today on Wall Street. We'll hope it continues throughout the day. We'll take another peek a little bit later on. Also some very encouraging numbers here at home, and it has to do with the city's animal shelter, Animal Care Services. Yeah, it uh, says that San Antonio's Animal Care Services just ended its fiscal year with the highest live release rate for animals in its history. The 92% live release rate made ACS, quote, one of the most successful animal shelters in the state of Texas. So that live release percentage is determined by all pets that are adopted, rescued, transferred to another shelter, or returned to their owners after being lost. All right, so they're telling us more than 6,000 pets were adopted or taken to forever homes, while partnerships with other rescues and sister shelters saved almost 10,600 animals, according to ACS. Now, there were reunions of 7,300 pets with their families, and more than 1,000 foster parents were able to provide a shelter without walls during the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm going to skip down to this next uh, stat. ACS says the fiscal year also marks the lowest number of pets hit by cars in seven years and said 12,800 citations were issued to protect pets and the community. But they did not elaborate on what those citations were for specifically. Specifically. And then out of uh, 27,194 animals brought into the shelter, 2,204 were euthanized, the lowest rate in the shelter's history, according to ACS officials. An ACS report from last year shows the shelter had a 90% euthanasia rate back in 2004, and in 2011 had a release rate of 32%. So they've come a very, very long way. And again, that's some fantastic news from Animal Care Services here in the uh, Alamo City. Well done on a 92% save rate. Yeah, a very good rate. Very good news this morning. And for now, let's take a look at today's Night at Nine. President-elect Joe Biden has announced his COVID-19 advisory task force. The group of public health experts will offer guidance to Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris as they prepare to take over the executive branch. President Donald Trump still has not publicly conceded. Sources say his campaign is planning a messaging blitz and pushing legal challenges designed to cast doubt on the election results and delay their certification. November is already proving to be a brutal month for the coronavirus in the U.S. More than 100,000 new cases were reported Sunday, making it the fifth worst day since the pandemic began. Drug maker Pfizer says an early look at data from its coronavirus vaccine shows it is more than 90% effective. The company is on track to file an emergency use application with U.S. regulators later this month. Congress will return to Washington today following an election recess. Over the break, both Republican and Democratic lawmakers have continued to call for a coronavirus stimulus package, but it's unclear if lawmakers will be able to pass a bill before Biden is sworn into office. Tropical storm Ada made landfall in the Florida Keys last night. It comes days after leaving dozens of people dead and over 100 missing in Mexico and Central America. A small plane crash in Guatemala shortly after takeoff Sunday, killing at least one person. The aircraft was transporting humanitarian aid to areas heavily affected by tropical storm Ada. The legendary host of the popular quiz show Jeopardy, Alex Trebek, has died. The official Jeopardy Twitter account said Trebek died at his home in California early Sunday morning, surrounded by family and friends. Richard Branson's Virgin Hyperloop has completed the world's first passenger ride on a super high-speed levitating pod system. It's a key safety test for a technology that the company hopes will transform human and cargo transportation. And that is today's Nine at Nine. So you hope that that comes to a gradual stop versus a, <laughs> yeah, a, like a hit, sudden stop. Yeah, speed bump to be yeah, bad and sure, that thing. I'm sure they're working on it. <laughs> I'm sure they are too. I haven't been outside yet really this morning, uh, but it seems like it's pretty nice out there. Now, if I didn't know otherwise, Justin, yep. I would think we have storms on the horizon, but we don't. It looks that way. You got some dark clouds there off in the distance, but no rain. 
And these are just those morning glow clouds. They're going to pass by. We'll see the uh, clouds sort of clear out this afternoon. You know the drill here. It's uh, it's going to be sunny later this afternoon. Temperatures will warm up. 71 degrees right now. Southerly winds at about 11 miles per hour. Look at the dew point, 65. We're in November, okay? We need these viewpoints to come down. We will get some drier air tomorrow, uh, but it's not going to really cool down that much. Today, we're up around 83 for a high and then dropping down into the 70s and 60s tonight. It'll be humid to start again tomorrow before we get a weak frontal boundary coming through. Uh, let's take a look at the visible satellite picture. You can see where the clouds are. Quite a bit of them. Uh, there are some breaks so as you get out towards Seguin, New Braunfels, up to San Marcos. A little thicker cloud cover west of town. Places like Hondo and Bandera looking at cloudy skies. 70 is for the most part here around Bear County, so we're off to another warm start. And again, 83 is our expected high temperature. Sunset tonight around 541. Uh, we do have a frontal battery tomorrow. We'll talk about what that means for our forecast and we'll also look down the line. Could there be rain chances way off in the distance? We'll let you know. Coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. Thanks, Justin. Let's check traffic real quick. And there's uh, not much to speak of there at I-37 and Jones Avenue. Top stories we are following today. San Antonio police are investigating the possibility that a woman was driving while intoxicated when she crashed on I-10 southeast of downtown early this morning. Officers tell us an infant was in the vehicle with her and was seriously injured. Police say the woman was driving on the shoulder of I-10 near Roland shortly after 2 this morning. For some reason, they say she suddenly cut across all lanes of the highway and slammed into the median. Police tell us the three month old baby boy suffered a fractured skull. They say his car seat was not properly secured. It's not clear right now what type of injuries the woman suffered. Investigators say she was booked for intoxication assault. San Antonio police and crime stoppers are asking for your help tracking down a robbery suspect. Police tell us it happened at a Cricket wireless store at Southeast Military and Roosevelt last Friday around 2.30 in the afternoon. So take a look at your screen and see if you recognize this man. Police say he walked up to an employee and motioned for her to stay quiet while showing her a handgun. Police tell us the man demanded money from the employee and then left the store and ran away. If you recognize him or have any information that can lead to an arrest, arrest call Crime Stoppers 210-224-STOP. You may be eligible for a cash reward of up to five grand. San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo is still a few months away, but right now you have a chance to help the rodeo during a fundraising event. The virtual super silent auction kicking off the day. The rodeo had to postpone several fundraisers amid the pandemic. This auction will help the rodeo support its mission of uh, helping educate the youth of Texas. Some of the packages up for auction include a weekend getaway, spots for mutton busting, and gas for a year. You can participate online at sarodeo.givesmart.com. Bidding ends on Sunday. Day at midnight. After a weekend of celebrations, the Biden Harris team is getting down to the business of running the country. The president and vice, sorry, president elect and vice president elect have plans to tackle top priorities starting today. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump has yet to concede the race. CNN's Karen Kafa is in Washington, D.C. this morning with a recap of the weekend's developments and a look at what's next. After a weekend of celebrations, President-elect Joe Biden plans to assume a role as healer in chief of a nation struggling with the coronavirus pandemic and its economic consequences. He's done it in his personal life through unimaginable tragedy, and now he's going to do it for the American people. With many of President Trump's supporters unwilling to accept last week's results, Biden, in his victory speech Saturday night, extended a hand to those 71 million Americans who did not vote for him. I've lost a couple times myself, but now... Let's give each other a chance. Some members of the Biden-Harris team approaching the challenges of this transition like those during the one between George W. Bush and Barack Obama in 2008 when the nation was mired in the Great Recession. This morning, the Biden team announced a 12-person coronavirus task force. What I can tell you right now today uh, is that Joe Biden is going to make good on his promises on the campaign trail. Meanwhile, as President Trump shows no signs of conceding and continues to make baseless accusations of electoral fraud, the Biden-Harris team and even a few Republicans are ready to move on. I don't think we're going to see anything that's going to overturn this election, and I haven't seen any evidence of widespread. You know, the, we, this is the way our system works. Whether we whether you like it or not, it's it's time to get behind the winner of the race. In Washington, I'm Karen Kafa. In your other morning headlines, authorities in Roseville, California, searching for a man they say threatened a store clerk with a machete.
Surveillance video shows this man getting aggressive, then reaching into his pants and pulling out a machete. The clerk runs to get a phone and call police. That's when the suspect starts hitting the plexiglass. Roseville police say the suspect is known to officers and wanted for questioning about this crime and others. Officers say he stole from the store and broke into a car in a parking lot just moments after this violent attack. Also in California, police are looking for six to eight people accused of ransacking a Turkish restaurant. Cameras inside the cafe show vandals destroying the Beverly Hills restaurant while it was open. At least one person was hurt. They say employees followed the vandals outside where they were attacked again. Investigators say there has been a long-standing tense relationship between Armenians and Turkish employees of this family-owned business. They were saying we're here to kill Turks and we, we hate you guys. Uh, you guys must die. Uh, and a lot of other uh, death, uh, death threats. Employees said they have been receiving threats for weeks, even though they have not been vocal politi politically and have business partners and customers who are Armenian. All right, take a look at this video taken right before a private air ambulance crash right on top of a hospital in Los Angeles. Investigators say the pilot and two others were on board when somehow the helicopter malfunctioned and made a hard landing. A hospital intern said the building shook and debris flew everywhere. Medics treated the three people aboard before they were taken to the hospital to get checked out. Now, hospital officials say the chopper was carrying a donated heart, and they say they were able to get that organ to the person who needed it. And time now is 9.09, still ahead on GMSA at 9. It's a modified version of a podcast. It allows people who are hard of hearing to follow along how a group of grad students at St. Mary's University right here in San Antonio came up with the clever idea. And the Cowboys almost almost had their hands on their Steelers, or almost handed the Steelers their first loss of the season. And the Texans finally add to their win column. Our RJ Marcus will be here later in the newscast with a recap of weekend sports. Santa already in town, but how will the pandemic affect Santa Claus visits this year? Erica Hernandez has details on that on more trending stories coming up next right here on GMSA at 9. And welcome back. It is 913. A rescue dog will soon call the White House home. And Santa visits still possible this year in a free holiday celebration that features 2 million lights. Those are just some of the stories trending this morning on KSAT.com. Erica Hernandez from our digital team joining us live from home with details. Erica, how was your weekend? It was great, guys. How was yours? Not bad. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty low key, I think, yeah. for just about everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about this rescue dog. Well, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris aren't the only ones making history with their election. When one of Joe Biden's German Shepherds will be the first ever rescue dog to live in the White House. The Bidens around two years ago adopted Major from the Delaware Humane Association. They first fostered him before they adopted. The other German Shepherd the Bidens have is Champ, who was a former who was from a breeder. In this article, we have some photos of the Bidens with their pups, including the original posting from two years ago from the Delaware Humane Association on the day that Major was adopted. Champ and Major will be the first dogs to reside at the White House since Bo and Sonny, former President Obama's Portuguese water dogs. How cool is this? A rescue dog in the White House. I, I didn't realize this was the first one. I, I mean, I haven't been paying that close attention. I just assumed there had been some before. Well, on the early edition of GMSA, Erica, we actually did a deep dive oh, into yes. the history of presidential <laughs> pets, and we didn't know a whole bunch of stuff. Somebody had a snake. Teddy uh, Roosevelt had a, a whole, snake. practically a zoo. And there were two cubs, like two, oh, bear, bear, cubs. two bear cubs, but they, uh, for Thomas Jefferson, but they yeah. got dangerous, so he got to get, he had to get rid of them. So you now, <laughs> now you know what I'm getting okay. my doctoral thesis in, presidential pets. Mm -hmm. I have to go do some research then because I had no idea about all that. <laughs> I'm learning a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> well, visits with Santa are still possible this year, guys. And in fact, he's already in town. Santa's sleigh arrived to the Alamo City over the weekend and was welcome at his wonderland nestled inside the Bass Pro Shop at the Rim. Of course, there are some COVID-19 safety measures in place, temperature checks, frequent sanitation, face coverings, and social distancing. The major change for visitors is when it's their turn to see Santa and take pictures with him. According to store reps, the kids will be able to sit on a little bench near Santa and an acrylic barrier will be in place. The camera is set up at a precise location to avoid a glare in pictures. Photos with Santa are free, but you must book a reservation ahead before your visit. And FYI, Santa says despite the pandemic, 
there are no shortage of toys or cookies this holiday season. So that's good news, right? That's yes, great news. That's yeah. awesome. They're going to be really busy out there. But yeah, got to let all the little ones know everything's going to be okay. Get mm -hmm. those lists in. Santa will take care yes. of the rest. Yes, that was my my little one's primary concern. How, how is he going to know what we want for Christmas? Yeah, <laughs> is Christmas still on? <laughs> yeah, like it's it still is. on. Yeah, it's still on. It's a little different, but we're, we'll get, Rudy will be covered. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Speaking of the holidays, you might want to take a drive to Marble Falls this year. The 30th season of the Walkway of Lights returns on November 20th. This takes place at Lakeside Park and includes more than 2 million lights covering over 350 sculptures. There is no cost to attend. However, visitors are welcome to give monetary donations to help support the event and local nonprofits. Ice skating will also be available. It's $10 for kids and $12 for adults. Masks are required for all activities when visitors are unable to maintain social distancing. I don't know if you guys have ever gone um, to Marble Falls during the holidays, but I heard it's gorgeous up there through, to see this um, the celebration they have there. Nice town. I've been, not been during the holidays. I, I, I haven't. Recall. I haven't either. Mm -hmm. I used to work in the area, but we never happened to be there during this time of year. Yeah, I guess we'll have to caravan up there one day. <laughs> yeah, we sure will. Now, now to your national days of the week. Not much going on today, but tomorrow is National Vanilla Cupcake Day and Sesame Street Day. Wednesday is Veterans Day. Thursday is okay. National Pizza with the Works Except Anchovies Day. Okay. Hallelujah. Thanks for the yes, qualifier. Yes. We need to get those fishies <laughs> off there. <laughs> Friday is World Kindness Day, Saturday is National Pickle Day, and Sunday is Clean Out Your Refrigerator Day. Oh my gosh, that's so yeah. every day at our house. Luis is always throwing <laughs> stuff out. I'm like, we just bought that. Right. Yeah. Steph's okay. like, I ate that two weeks ago. It's still good. No, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> it's still good if it's like from yesterday. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Everybody's yes. rules are a little different. Yeah. All right. So good days of the week. Uh, and we, of course, salute our, salute our veterans every day yes. of the year here in Military yes. City USA. Thank you, Erica. You guys have a good one. You, you too, too, Erica. Thanks. Justin's back now with a look at the forecast and uh, the banner on the graphic behind him is something about a dry streak. Mm -mm. Not a good one. Not a good one. I, I, we hate starting off with this, but it's it's just where we are right now. It has been since September 21st that we had any sort of significant rain. It was back on September, September 21st that we got about half an inch. Uh, we haven't received a tenth of an inch or more since then. And so we're going 48 days now without any sort of significant important rain. And uh, there's a little bit in the forecast tomorrow, but it's not looking great. We really need a pattern change. 72 degrees right now. South southeasterly winds at about 14. That's drawing in a lot of humidity this morning. Dew points are way up there. And that's why we're seeing some of the clouds, some of the fog. There has been a little bit of drizzle here and there, but that hasn't been a big issue. 68 degrees, Canyon Lake, 69 Boulevard. We're up to 70 in a lot of spots here across Bear County. Saw a little bit of sun earlier. Looks like clouds have filled back in at least for now. 67 Bandera, 70 in Hondo. And looking at the low to mid 70s down to the south and west as well. There's look the cloud cover. So it's thickest basically off to the west of San Antonio, places like Uvalde, Eagle Pass, Rock Springs. But you'll notice we're starting to see some breaks here along the I-37, I I-35. And this trend will continue. We'll see more sun as we get into the afternoon. Dew points, though, high in the 60s. It's, it's sticky out there. This does not feel like November. And as we go through time here, the dew points stay up through most of today. Tomorrow morning, we'll start to watch a weak frontal battery come in, and that should lower dew points. We think it'll be here by about midday or so. When it does, it'll drop those dew points off into the 40s here in San Antonio. It'll be fairly dry across the hill country, but our coastal counties will still be looking at pretty thick humidity. So it'll be a dividing line there. And then by Wednesday morning, most of us in the dry air. But I got to tell you, it doesn't last very long because by Wednesday afternoon, humidity comes right back in. So this is a short lived event for us. Uh, you see the trough out west. That's what's going to drive that weak frontal boundary through. We've got Tropical Storm Ada down here also that we've got to watch uh, near the Florida Keys. A little closer look at Texas, though. That trough is close by, but it's going to move to the north and take a lot of the energy with it. And that's why our rain chances aren't so great. You'll notice there is some snow associated with it, some rain across parts of Nebraska this morning. Let's look at our future cast. Clouds go away this afternoon, so it's a quiet day. And then tomorrow, clouds fill back in. We get a broken line of showers, if we're lucky, and about 11 o'clock or so, we may see a sprinkle, a shower. It's not going to add up to much. Front comes through, sort of falls apart, uh, stalls out a little bit. We may still get some clouds Wednesday morning, but most of Wednesday should be pretty nice. Very quick check in on Tropical Storm Ada. Winds are at 60 miles per hour, gusting to 70. 
and uh, it is still bringing some rain to South Florida. This thing's going to meander around again. There are some models that just keep it out in the middle of the Gulf, but the, the latest track from the Hurricane Center takes us back up towards northern Florida with winds at 40 miles per hour on Saturday. It's been an interesting storm. It's kind of been all over the map, quite literally. Uh, 76 degrees noontime. We'll be up around 83 degrees today with those mostly sunny skies during the afternoon. And then we'll go 81 tomorrow, just a 10% chance of rain. Veterans Day looks good. 80, mostly sunny, 81 Thursday. Another very slight chance of a shower Friday, but still nothing significant, guys. Gotcha, Justin. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <Gotcha>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Okay, we hold them to a different standard. 921, 72 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9, podcasts have become very popular, but not everyone is able to listen to them. How a group of graduate students at St. Mary's University created a podcast for people who are hard of hearing and they could still enjoy it. 924 podcasts have increased in popularity over the last several years, but they compose limitations for members of deaf and hard of hearing community. Tiffany Huerta spoke with some students at St. Mary's University who kept that issue in mind when creating their podcast. And everybody was coming at me. Have you heard this podcast? Have you heard this podcast? You should listen to this. And I'm like, I physically cannot. Like, the most I can hear on a good day is vowels, and that's with hearing aids. Podcasts are a solely audio-based entertainment platform, easy to use for most, but not for the deaf and hard of hearing. That's what inspired four graduate students at St. Mary's University to start their own version of a podcast, The Modcast. We were talking about, you know, modified podcast. Um, we also wanted to do mini podcast because we wanted these to be bite-sized, and so... Uh, we came up with modified mini podcast, which is the Modcast. The Modcast episodes are focused mainly on English literature and language, topics familiar to these English majors. The thing that makes their podcast more accessible is each episode comes with a transcript to help those hard of hearing follow along, and so deaf listeners can still enjoy the conversations. The four Modcast founders also manage a website with book recommendations and blog posts from site creators and guests. The COVID-19 pandemic is also a hot topic these days. We have asked a lot of people and teachers, that sort of thing, professors at St. Mary's University, is their pandemic pivot. So during lockdown, what kept them busy if they took up new sort of hobbies? The Modcast is going strong and reaction positive. I would say that it, it's, it's been pretty successful with my deaf community, the people that I socialize with. Modcast creators say they're adding new material all the time and looking forward to making their site even better for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Right now it's 926, 72 degrees. And there's a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. We're entering week two of No Shave November. And as you can see, the beards and mustaches are looking a bit fuller. I could see here Mark motioning to his beard. <laughs> We're going to take a look at progress pictures for the entire team and get an update on our fundraising efforts. And the country mourning the loss of Jeopardy host Alex Trebek would take a look back at his remarkable life and career. And the Cowboys put up quite a fight against the Steelers. I'm not sure if this is the right video, but we're going to talk about that mm -hmm. coming up with RJ. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. And welcome back. It's 930. So the Cowboys kind of came close, but they fell short of beating the NFL's only undefeated team. Got to be honest, RJ Marquez, as mm -hmm. we're here to break down the football weekend. Mm -hmm. Still an exciting game. I know a lot of fans were posting on me. Can you believe this? We're in it. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Shocker here. And I got to say, guys, I'm I'm a little disappointed because before David left last week, he was like, you know what? I'm going to let you use the soapbox if you need it. <laughs> I feel like I left a Ferrari in the garage or something like that because I was not able to use it. What happened here? The Cowboys actually uh, gave us a competitive game uh, considering their circumstance here. Garrett Gilbert, the four starting quarterback for the Cowboys this season. Uh, remember the days of when Dak <laughs> was, <laughs> when we were talking about his contract extension. Uh, yeah, making his debut here, NFL debut, a former Texas SMU quarterback like Travis Kidd. And uh, look at this. Touchdown there, CD Lamb, Cowboys up by 10 early. But as we have seen throughout uh, this entire season, uh, a few defensive breakdowns. They did play better though. This was right before the half. 
costly touchdown there. Uh, they, but they were still it. They were still up 13 to nine. Even going into the fourth quarter, they were up 19 to nine, and it just kind of slipped away there at the end. Now I gotta say, if I had to bring the soapbox out for anything, I hate to do this, but it would have been the officials. The officials kind of cost, cost the Cowboys uh, this game a little bit here, especially on these final drives that the Steelers had. Again, just uh, Cowboys made a few plays here and there. This was the uh, winning touchdown, I believe. There it is. Yeah, Eric Ebron leaps over the Cowboys defender. Steelers win this one 24 to 19. And again, Garrett Gilbert had himself a solid game, 21 to 38. Uh, this was the last pass. Not good there, but but uh, Cowboys, uh, they fall to two and seven on the season. Uh, they are off next week and then they are at Minnesota. But guys, again, like we were saying, not a bad effort, probably their best overall effort uh, this entire season. I mean, maybe going back to the Atlanta game, but even the Atlanta game, that was uh, they were down big and that one made a big comeback there. But a tough loss for them. A little that, bit more of a complete game with Garrett mm -hmm. Gilbert under center. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens if they uh, continue to start Garrett Gilbert after the bye week or go back to Andy Dalton. I think I like what I saw out of Garrett Gilbert, but I think that uh, it seems like they want to maybe go back to Dalton, get a little bit more consistency there. Cool. So. Let's talk Texans Jazz. Yes. All right. The Houston Texans. All right. They have not won a road game all season. In fact, their only win this season was against Jacksonville. So what better way to get your second win against these uh, these really bad Jacksonville Jaguars uh, <laughs> early on there. Brandon Cooks, nice touchdown, long touchdown. They've been waiting for that all season. Uh, Duke Johnson stepped in for David Johnson, got hurt earlier. Duke Johnson taking care of business there. Here was kind of the critical play of the game, and I know our banners covering it, but uh, the we're going to see here on this uh, upcoming replay, the play clock had actually gone to zero here. You could see right there. right there. The play clock was at zero for about three, four seconds. The refs do not call a delay a game and ends up leading to this Will Fuller touchdown. And uh, yeah, Texans end up, that ended up being the winning score, 27-16. The Texans take care of business. Uh, pretty interesting thing here. J.J. Watt mm -hmm. with a nice strip sack there. And J.J. Uh, Watt actually moved in to uh, one of the top ranks for sacks this season for his career. And I saw something kind of disturbing earlier today that the Texans might think about trading J.J. Watt at the end of this season. <laughs> I, that would just, I, look, I'm not a Texans fan, but I would lose my mind. Well, why not What's add that? to the list of silly trades made in the last season? Or <laughs> there so, you right? go. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, in no. fact, he moved up to the list. He's now up there with Lawrence Taylor, Demarcus Ware, uh, Bruce Smith. Uh, the Texans are at Cleveland next week. They better not trade J.J. Watt after everything he's done for that I city. I know. Yeah. Fans will abandon ship we can't quick. Even, yeah, oh, we can't even get goodness. some good Texans news without there being some uh, negative. But Texans take care of business there. They are at Cleveland next week. So always oh, yeah. a catch. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, anyway. Moving on to college. All right. There you go, Steph. <laughs> Hook them. <laughs> yeah. Yay. That's it. That's all we're gonna get. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. UT at home taking on West Virginia, and uh, the Horns there got out to a nice lead. West Virginia kept this game close though, and UT ended up pulling away here. Uh, Bijan Robinson, very nice running here. This uh, freshman running back rushed for over a hundred yards. Really nice move there. We're going to show it again. Nice little spin move there by Robinson. And uh, again, it seems like the UT is kind of uh, rounding out pretty well here. They improved to 5-2, and two, take care of business against West Virginia. A little bit of a controversial call at the end of this game also with the uh, late in the game. West Virginia was driving down the field. We're going to watch it here. Could have taken the lead, mm. but uh, no call there. What do you guys think? Pass interference? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> what? Oh, my God. Just Absolutely like not. Just like, yes. <laughs> West Virginia, look at this guy. The head coach is uh, not happy. Uh, yeah, Horns win. They're off next week, and then they play at Kansas after that. All right. Moving on to the Texas A&M Aggies. Basically, we're saving the best for last. How do you like that, Justin? Love he loves it. <laughs> Longhorn um, still won. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Longhorn still won. Aggies win here. Kellen Mond is uh, continuing to rewrite the Aggies record book there. Uh, touchdown earlier to Jalen Wittemeyer for their second TD connection. Aggies led at halftime. Then Kellen Mond does it all himself there. He ends up tying Jared Johnson for the most career TD passes at AM. Jared Johnson, that's a blast from the past. Aggies take care of business big time uh, at South Carolina. They move up to fifth in the college rankings. Looking pretty good so far. They play uh, at Tennessee next week, so it'll be a, it, it's going to be a tough test there. But I like where Texas A&M is going right now. Well, Mr. Mond has got people saying Johnny who? Oh, uh, uh, well, yeah. there we go. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you, RJ. Congrats, Justin. Thank, Thank you, you RJ. You, as well. <laughs> Thank you. you notice how Steph went from woo to woo now that yeah. AM's woo actually beat a UT's won a few games <laughs> yeah. in a little more resounding fashion? <laughs> a little 936, 72 degrees. Let's look outside with live cam. It's a decent 72 degrees now. Yeah, I stepped outside. It wasn't too bad. Yeah, it's, it's not bad. It's just you would think in November we would get some cool mornings, mm -hmm. maybe some lower humidity. That's not happening. And we've got some warm weather really all the way through the weekend. Pollen count, the allergens have been pretty good to us so far this fall. Mold is low and it's it's been low for some time now, so nothing big there to worry about. Visible satellite picture shows those clouds trying to break up a little bit. We're certainly seeing some sun as you get down towards Nixon and Floresville, up towards Seguin, a little bit uh, here in San Antonio too. 66 Bernie State, 73 New Braunfels, 73 Cashcoville, 70 in Hondo. Surprise, surprise, they're going to be up around 80 today, maybe a little bit warmer than that, 83. Sunsets around 541 and then down into the 70s and 60s tonight. There's a slight rain chance tomorrow. Maybe a little bit of hope uh, late this week. Uh, we'll see. We'll talk about that uh, seven day forecast coming up in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Let's take a look outside with Transguide I-35 Judson. Things running smoothly right now and looking OK there as well at I-10 and Vance Jackson. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Osterhage. I'm doing the no-shave November for my dad. He had prostate cancer a few years ago. Everything was taken care of. He's fine. I'm doing it for my grandfather, who 50 years ago had prostate cancer, and unfortunately, it ended up spreading. I'm doing it for my two boys, so they're aware of, of things like this, and they know what to do and to get regular checkups as they get older. And everyone out there, just be aware of this. Last month, all the focus was on the ladies, rightly so. And now, guys, don't forget, you got to focus on yourself. Thank you very much, Mike. All right, here's our after week one. Here's how the whiskers are looking in the KSAT 12 <laughs> newsroom. Very nice. Myself, very nice. Gary, Mr. Berger, Stephen Cavazos, Devin Clark, looking good. Dylan Collier, so serious. Uh, Justin <laughs> Horn, eh. Actually, Justin, it's kind of, it seems like it's coming in nicer than last yes, year. Yes, looks nice. Well, thank you. Yeah, yes. is that, are you using Miracle Grow or? Oh, or, gosh. Or what? It's a secret. <laughs> it's a secret. But the uh, fundraising does continue. Oh, there's RJ. Yep. Max Massey looking dapper as ever. Mr. Osterhage. David Sears with the Texas Tech baseball hat on. And, and the officer, Marcus <laughs> Trujillo. But the fundraising does continue. That's right. So let's take a look at our leaderboard here. We have Mark in the lead. Congratulations. $660 raised. Yeah, Justin's got 85 bucks raised so yeah. far. Yeah. Second place, we got Marcus uh, with 50, Mike 50, then Dylan and Nick with 25. All right. So if you'd like to donate, go to ksat.com. We have uh, links there and everything. And I've also got stuff on my KSAT Facebook page, KSAT Mark Austin. Later on today, I will repost the team link so that you can donate to other guys on our team. Or the I, team as a whole. Or the team as a whole. I think you could probably make a team donation. Yes, yeah, you yeah. can do that as well. Cool. <laughs> 940 right now, 72 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. And remembering Alex Trebek, the host of Jeopardy, who passed away over the weekend. We take a look back at his life and legacy next. If you missed uh, Top of the Newscast, the Dow is having a very good day coming off of the uh, election news over the weekend and promising news from Pfizer that their vaccine so far is showing a 90% success rate. And that has resonated on Wall Street with uh, the Dow at 1,100 points at 29,423. Monday morning, 943. Welcome back. Tributes pouring in from across the country after the passing of one of America's most beloved figures. Jeopardy host Alex Trebek died yesterday after a battle with stage four pancreatic cancer. ABC's TJ Holmes has more on his remarkable life and career. And now, here is the host of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek. He was the man who had all the answers, while contestants and viewers tried to come up with the questions. Nancy. Who is Larry David? Right, Ken. I get to say it to Alex. What is OK Boomer? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Humble, steady, polite to the last. For 37 years as host of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek wanted to make the show about its stars, the contestants. But his personal bout with pancreatic cancer put him in a new spotlight and gave a different feel to the show's current season. This from only a few days ago. I'm an immigrant, and like a lot of immigrants, we have a hard time learning English. 
And so growing up, um, <clears throat> my, uh, my grandfather would sit me on his lap and we'd watch you. And uh, I credit you for my perfect diction. So thank you. And where Trebek was always rooting for everyone, you can see them now rooting for him. What it is, we love you out. That's very kind. Of you. <laughs> thank you. Costs you 1995. You're left with a bu five bucks. Okay. Put into terms what these fans mean to you, fans of the show. They are the most important elements in my life outside of my family and friends. I can't help but be touched by what they have to say. Born in Canada in 1940, George Alexander Trebek started out professionally as an announcer for the Canadian broadcasting system. I was a staff announcer and I was the only bilingual announcer on the English-speaking staff, so I got to do extra programming. I was 27 years old at the time. I was, I was having a good time. This is Jeopardy! In 1984, he was picked to host a revived version of Jeopardy and never looked back. For the next three and a half decades and more than 8,000 shows, he became such a respected referee and personality that even the parodies were basically kind to him. Welcome to Celebrity Jeopardy! And better still when Trebek himself joined in. It's time for Final Jeopardy! And so this was the Final Jeopardy! Never be afraid of poking fun at yourself. Self-deprecating humor is worth its weight in gold. Then last year, Trebek first shared the somber news. This week, I was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. He quickly became an advocate for early detection with an openness that continued during the months of treatment that followed. There was one day a few weeks ago when uh, Jeannie asked me in the morning, how do you feel? And I said, I feel like I want to die. It was that bad. Yeah. What does your wife say to you when you say something like that to her? I apologized to her and explained that it has nothing to do with my love for her or my feelings for her. Trebek told me this summer that if an experimental immunotherapy treatment wasn't effective, he was not going to try any further extraordinary measures. He died surrounded by family at 80 years old. Remember now the way he wanted to be. What you see on air really is what I am. And uh, I'm a reasonably nice guy and uh, I'd like you to view me that way. I don't go out of my way to malign anybody. I want to be considered as helpful and generous, generous and kind. And you are, and you were. That was ABC's TJ Holmes reporting. Yeah, amazing life and career. 947, back to Justin, and uh, more on our forecast. And what, what's the picture you have for us this morning, Justin? So we, uh, we found a couple raindrops this this really? is exciting. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> it looks like there's a couple drops. This was, uh, I think, west of San Antonio. Uh, I saw some on the deck there. It's just a little rain, just a little bit. But uh, you know what? We'll take it. Uh, there is a little bit of drizzle in spots out there with uh, some of the slow cloudiness that we've been seeing at, here in San Antonio. Those clouds are actually trying to break up a little bit. And uh, we're sitting at 72 degrees at the airport, 70 at Stinson, 73 Kelly, 72 at Randolph. You'll notice we've got southeast Julie winds here across the board, so that's shoving in a lot of moisture. It's sticky out there, and that's really not going to change much today. 69 Canyon Lake, 73 New Braunfels. At general rule of thumb here, just uh, low 70s here in Bear County and the 60s in the Hill Country. Uh, 74 Katua and 75 down there in Kennedy, pretty warm there. Dew point is very high also. You see the dew points in the 60s here, that puts us squarely in the muggy category. And again, these two points are going to come down much this afternoon, so expect it to feel kind of sticky. It doesn't feel like November at all. We will get a, a brief reprieve tomorrow, so a frontal boundary comes through, and that should lower dew points a little bit. I think tomorrow and Wednesday, so you'll, it'll feel a little bit better out there. In fact, these two points, so 50s, I think it could probably even be a little bit lower than that before we build that dew point back by the end of the week. And by Friday with two points in the mid-60s, we'll have another slight chance for some drizzle, maybe a light shower. Nothing significant, unfortunately. Uh, visible satellite picture shows, yes, those clouds are trying to break up a little bit here around Bear County and off to the east. Cloud deck's a little thicker as you get out towards Del Rio, Eagle Pass, and New Valley. But everybody at this point is at least seeing some cloud cover this morning. Here's the setup. We have a big trough of low pressure out west. This is creating some snow and some rain uh, to our west. 
but its track is going to take it off to our north and east, and we're not going to get much energy from that. It will help to pull that weak frontal boundary in, but that's about it. Of course, we have Tropical Storm Ada down here around the Keys as well. A little closer look here at Texas. Things are quiet now. As that system comes in, there could be some rain. We just don't think that there will be much around here. And looking at the future gas, clouds clear out this afternoon. So by 5 o'clock, we're looking at pretty good weather. And then by tomorrow, here comes the front. Uh, a couple showers right along it tomorrow morning. I think if we're, uh, probably the best chance of rain is going to be up in the Hill Country initially as this front moves in. As it gets towards San Antonio, there's just not much to work with here. A shower or two, and then the clouds should clear out some behind it as it sort of stalls down to our south. It's not going to bring much cool down at all. Just some of that drier air as we talked about. So forecast for today, 76 noontime. Clouds will clear out 83 degrees. Your high temperature southeasterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And here's the extended forecast. 10% chance tomorrow. 80 on Wednesday, 81 Thursday. Uh, added moisture Friday. So we're going to see quite a bit of cloud cover. There could be a shower, maybe some drizzle. And then they're looking at low 80s this weekend. And by the way, we look down the line. We're talking 8, 12 days out still shows temperatures well above average, even going into mid-November. So just the messenger. I know <laughs> like a cooler Thanksgiving. We'll see what, what it brings, All but right. it's not looking great. Okay, well, maybe we'll just uh, keep the jacket in reserve for right now. There you go. So Thank turkey you. and stuffing, hot off the stove, the AC cranking away. Yes, <laughs> in our t-shirt and shorts. Happy Thanksgiving, <laughs> South Texas style. Right now, 951, 72 degrees. We'll be right back. So take a look at this tiny toddler playing table tennis, the three year old ping pong phenomenon lives in southwestern China. And according to his family, the boy has been practicing since he was an infant. Oh. Can, do I have to read or can I watch? <laughs> I know, it's amazing, He's right? He's had help from grandma who is a former professional table tennis player. She's been his trainer since he started playing. The family says he's already a fierce competitor and has gained a social media fan base of some 50,000 followers. Wow, look at him go. That's awesome. Good morning. Hey there. Coming up on Live with Kelly and Ryan, we'll chat with Jillian Anderson from The Crown. Plus, the new Bachelorette joins us as well. See you soon on Live. And tomorrow on GMSA at 9, thousands of clinical trials are underway across the country to study vaccine candidates and treatments for COVID-19. But some bad actors are working to take advantage of clinical volunteers to make a quick buck. In this week's Money It's Personal, Ivan Herrera has some advice to help you find a legitimate clinical trial and avoid the scammers. That's tomorrow at 9. We want to tell you about the Schwant party of... 16 now? Yes. Yeah, or maybe 17. A Michigan couple whose large family attracted attention by growing to include 14 sons has welcomed their first daughter wow. nearly three decades after the birth of their first kid. So this is a picture of Maggie Jane, weighed seven pounds and eight ounces and entered a world with 14 older brothers. Yeah, Jay uh, and Kateri Schwant are both 45. They said they are overjoyed and beyond excited to add a dash of pink to the household. They, nobody owns a stitch of clothing that's pink right now. <laughs> oh, wow. They're gonna have a big change ahead for them. Happy birthday. Yes, we'll see you guys later.